All right, guys, welcome to part two of Introduction to Forces, introduced by the Beastie Boys, Applying Force in one of their best videos, Sabotage. Well, let's get to it. All right, so today in this little video, we're going to talk about four different things. We're going to talk about first applied forces that you'll see anywhere, the pushes and the pulls. Then we're going to talk about something called reaction forces, which are coupled with normal forces. And the last thing we're going to look at is frictional forces and how to calculate it. All right, so these are the main forces we're going to be talking about in this unit, and we're going to have to be able to draw them and calculate them and explain them. So let's go. Okay. Applied forces is anything that is a push and a pull acting on an object. As you can see over here, here's a guy pushing on that mass, applying a force. Here's another guy pulling on it. There's a rope attached to him. And so those are both applied forces acting on a mass. I can push, I can pull. Maybe I'll have a thruster that's pushing on it, pushing that object up. But those are applied forces. And in this diagram, the total force acting on that mass is going to be the sum of the masses, the applied force and that pulling force adding together, okay? If they're going in opposite directions, you'd be subtracting them, all right? That's applied forces. A reaction force involves Newton's third law, which we're going to talk about in a later video. But a reaction force is the fact that every action, every applied force that I'm putting onto an object has an equal and opposite force acting in the opposite direction. So this guy is pushing He's applying a force onto that surface, and that force is going to react by applying an equal and opposite. So I call that my reaction. Okay? And he's going to sit there balanced out, not moving because it's a very heavy object. But if his applied force becomes greater than that reaction force or greater than the resistance force, that object is going to move. But this is what's called a force couple. Every applied force has an equal and opposite reaction force, okay? So if I'm standing, leaning up against a wall, okay, this is a wall, okay, the force that I apply onto the wall is going to be equal to the force that the wall applies back on me, and we're going to be balanced, and that's called a reaction force. Every force has a reaction force. All right, now a, spe a specific type of reaction force is called a normal force. Normal forces are forces that act perpendicular with surfaces. So here's a box that is on a table, and the force of gravity is going to be acting on that box. Now, that box should technically be falling through the table if there was no reaction force. But the surface of the table is going to be reacting back up against that force. That's what we're going to call our normal force. It's a reaction force to the force being applied. The force of gravity is pulling that box down. And the table is reacting by applying a force equal and opposite upwards. And because that force is perpendicular with the surface of contact, it is called a normal force. Because normal lines, typical line, a normal line is a per perpendicular line. So that's my normal force acting perpendicular upwards. Okay, And it would be acting right up against it. And they're equal and opposite. So why do we need to know about normal forces? Well, normal forces are very important when we talk about things such as friction, which we're going to get to in a second. So important resistance forces or frictional forces that are out there. We've talked a lot about air resistance when we're, when we're talking about cannonballs and launching things. Air resistance, another term for it is called drag, and, and that occurs because there's air molecules that are bumping into objects as they're moving through that fluid. And the more those air molecules bump into objects, the more pressure that they're going to apply and the more resistance that object's going to have as it's going through it. That's what air resistance is. It's friction between the air molecules and the surface of the object. Now, the more streamlined that object is, these are for the swimmers, the more streamlined you are, the less air resistance or the less water resistance you would have because the molecules have an easier path to go around you. Here's a diagram right over here of a car that's kind of boxy. And these are air molecules that can go over top of the car. The more that air molecule has to change its path, the more resistance there is. So this is like probably formed in a wind tunnel or it's through more of like a simulation showing the streamlines around that. And the more turbulence I have on the back, that causes more drag. So I can get rid of that turbulence by making this car more symmetrical and having those streamlines come down. 
All right, so people that are very fascinated about making fast race cars, they're looking at streamlining and minimizing air resistance and drag. So if you're driving a car very slowly, the air resistance is usually directly proportional just to the speed that you have. But if I drive my car very fast, you can see that air resistance becomes proportional to the speed squared. So it becomes increasingly, increasingly difficult to drive because of that air resistance there. And what we see here is a formula for drag when I'm going pretty fast. And I'll just explain a little bit about what's in these formulas because maybe one of you will want to do a little design lab uh, this quarter with drag, okay? So the force of drag or the force of air resistance is equal to a coefficient, a drag coefficient. Now that depends on the shape. A circular object, if you research online for the drag coefficient, so that's called my drag coefficient. A circular object has a particular coefficient, like we can call it like one, whereas a square object is going to have a different surface for those air molecules to bump into, and maybe let's call that like 3.0. So it would have more drag for the square object than it would for the circular object. Every shape of an object has a coefficient that you can find online. Okay, and this symbol right over here is my the density of your medium. Okay, so the more thick that medium is, the more drag you're going to have. So water is more dense than air, so you'd imagine that the resistance in water is going to be greater than it is in air. Okay, and then that V, I'm just going to change the color here. That V is your the velocity of your object. And that A is the area of the object. Okay, so the greater the area that I have in my surface, I can think about a parachute, the greater the area of my parachute, the greater the force of drag. The faster my speed, it's squared, the more drag I have. The more dense the medium I'm going through, the more drag. And that CD is the drag coefficient depending on the shape of my object. All right, so that formula, putting it all together, would allow me to calculate the force of resistance. Now, it's not something that I'd ask my grade 10s or even my grade 11s to do, but if you're interested in designing an experiment, this formula tells you how what variables you can change in your experiment. So that's kind of what physics is good for. It allows you to design cool experiments based on the variables that are in those equations. Okay. Now, frictional forces are, are a little different. Okay. Air resistance is caused by the bumping of air molecules. And friction is more caused by two surfaces coming together, this surface and that surface. And when they come together, there's resistance to the movement. And that resistance is caused by the fact that there's electron clouds on each surface that when they get close together, they repel. They don't want to get close together. And they're going to push against each other. So frictional forces are caused by electron clouds between two surfaces rubbing together. Now, take a second and think about what you're doing right now. You're sitting on a chair. Well, you're not really sitting on that surface. You're actually levitating on that surface because the electron cloud around your butt is repelling the electron cloud in the chair. All right, so if I drew the chair and uh, let's draw you, okay, you guys are repelling. Okay, you're actually levitating in air due to those electron clouds repelling from each other. Now, it's very, very small. And there's resistance from you sliding back and forth because those electron clouds are repelling each other. And that's called friction. Okay, so here's a diagram. This diagram that you see over here is called a free body diagram. We'll talk more about that in the next video. Okay, now what a free body diagram does is it illustrates all the forces acting on an object. So here's an object on a table, and it's, it says right here that blue line is an applied force. Something's pulling on that object with a force, force of 60 newtons. And while it's pulling, there's friction between that object and the table with a value of 20 newtons. Okay, the weight of that object is 196 newtons. That's the force of gravity. And this red line is the normal force. It's the reaction of the table pushing up with an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, so that's 196 newtons up, 196 newtons down. My applied force is 60. My frictional force is 20. The object is going to move in the right direction, but it's going to 
not move as fast as it would if there wasn't any friction. Okay, so as the diagram is showing, frictional forces always oppose the motion of a body. They all, if the object is moving that way and there's friction, it always goes in the opposite direction. And there are two types of friction. There's dynamic friction and there's static friction. So what is that? Dynamic friction is caused when an object is sliding over a surface. It's, al it's already in motion. So it's friction when body slides over another surface. Okay, so when this body is sliding over, the friction is caused by the electron clouds rubbing into each other. And that's a sliding friction. The other type of friction is static friction. It's the friction you experience when you get up and you're going to push a chair or a big object and you push on it and nothing happens for a couple seconds and all of a sudden it budges and starts to slide. So why does it happen when you push on a table? If I'm trying to push on my table right now, it takes a little time and then it starts to slide. Well, when objects sit on smooth surfaces over time, they slowly become bonded together. Okay, the electron clouds shift around and then the surfaces form this kind of electrostatic bond. Okay, the electrons will move up and the, they'll repel and the surface will become positively charged, that surface will become negatively charged. And the more smooth it is, the tighter that bond is gonna be. Okay, there's actually some interesting materials, very, very smooth materials that if you squeeze them together, they become bonded. You can't pull them apart because they're so smooth that they make a perfect surface contact and the electron clouds force a bond to happen. All right, so that bond resists the motion and it needs a little bit more push and that would be static friction. So there's two different types of friction. All right, and we can calculate friction using a formula. Just like I showed you for air resistance, here's a formula for friction. And this one we're gonna have to use. Okay, so the formula looks like this. FF is the symbol for the force of friction is equal to a coefficient of friction. Okay, that's usually a number between zero and one, but really sticky surfaces have a number that is greater than one, like one to three. Okay, and Fn is equal to the normal force. Okay, and that kind of makes sense. If I look back at this object here, friction is caused by the electron clouds bumping into each other. So that normal force is pushing the surface of the table up against that object, and it's making a tight squeeze right over there. So the normal force times whatever that friction coefficient is, a number usually between zero and one, will tell me the fraction of force that is creating friction. Okay, so how do I calculate the normal force? Remember, my normal force is equal to, basically, the equal and opposite of the force of gravity. So whatever my weight of that object is on the surface, that's my normal force. Okay, so let's try to calculate the force of dynamic friction. So that's sliding friction. When a 100 kilogram box slides over a surface with a friction coefficient of 0 0.7. So here's the free body diagram. Here's the force of friction. Here's the force of gravity. That's Fn, which is equal and opposite to the force of gravity, and the object is sliding in that direction. So how do I calculate the force of friction? Well, the force of friction is equal to mu, okay, my dynamic friction coefficient, times Fn. So the force of friction is equal to 0 0.7, because that's my frictional coefficient. And Fn, remember, Fn is equal to Fg. So what was Fg from the last video? Fg is equal to the mass times the acceleration of gravity. So mass times the acceleration of gravity. So the force of friction is equal to 0 0.7 times 100 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared. Okay? And if we get into our calculator really quick, let's punch it into the calculator. Okay, 0 0.7 times 100 times 9.81 leaves me with, oh, something wrong with my calculator, 0 0.7 times 100 times 9.81 equals 686.7 newtons. Okay, and that would be the force of friction between those two surfaces. Okay, so if you go look at the Google Doc that I've given you, there's a bunch of problems where you're going to have to calculate the force of friction and you're going to have to go back through this video and review some of the diagrams that I made and answer some of the questions.
All right, good luck.